Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. Subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, gear reviews, or tutorials. And to make things more exciting, I'm giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. Details are in the description down below or you can watch this video here, but please take a look at the terms and conditions as there are some age and location restrictions. And now for the news. Here's a quick recap of the weekly news. Canon will be announcing an APS-C R-System camera in 2021. It will have the same form factor as the Canon EOS R6 and be a high-end APS-C camera. It's likely to be called the R7. Now, this won't spell the end of the M system, but it certainly raises questions such as how long before Canon develops a less capable and more affordable R-System APS-C cameras. Now, that's it for news, but it didn't stop me from publishing a video about the best camera in 2020. And my, and my conclusion surprised many, but when considering The Ordinary Filmmaker, it's not such a surprise after all. I also did a review of the Heda Nano Pro Variable ND Filter, so if you're in the market for ND filters, check out this review. The filters are magnetic and come with their own lens cap, which is a nice touch. But now, it's time to answer your questions. Got a question for The Ordinary Filmmaker? Post it in the comments section down below, and it could be answered in next week's Q&A session. And now for our first question. Goblin asks, I was deciding between the Canon 60 Mark II and the EOS R. Should I wait for new announcements or should I buy now? Well, the way you phrase that, it sounds like you're, you're on the fence. You're not really sure what to get. And one of the first things I recommend for anybody in this situation is write down, document the capabilities, the outcomes you're looking for from a camera and make them no more than three to five words. Put them in Excel or uh, well, here's an example of what I did with the R5, the R6, and the EOS R in an upcoming video I'm working on. I've came up with all the capabilities that I'm looking for in a camera, and then I apply a heat map to help me identify how well it performs at a high level without digging into a lot of detail. So while there's an awful lot of detail here, I can visually be able to make an informed decision. So that's really important. And what I would do is come up with your baseline, put all the capabilities out there, and then compare it to the 60 Mark II and then the EOS R. And I'd certainly recommend waiting about six months, and here's why. Rumors indicate, and these are pretty solid rumors, or CR2s, that we're gonna be getting an entry-level um, full-frame mirrorless camera for the R system, and it's gonna be priced lower than the Canon EOS RP. They'll probably remove the EV, uh, probably have a single card slot, and who knows what else they'll do, but they're gonna price this really low. It's gonna be at most $899, and could go as low as $699, although I think $899, $799 is probably a better price. And then they're going to announce another camera priced between the current price of the EOS R and the R6. So it's going to be mid-priced and mid-capable between those two cameras. And I think those might be very interesting for you. And of course, then there's the R7. Uh, the R7 is supposed to come out in 2021. I don't know if it's the first half or second half. And at this point, we don't even have any leaked specifications. So I think that would um, that, that's my recommendation, Goblin. Nick asks... I've got the opportunity to help out a few local shops and thought it'd be a great opportunity to get some experience with video. What would be the best option for a mic that has good sound quality but also good ambient noise? Nick, that's a really good question and I'm still figuring out audio. Audio is like a whole separate study. There are people who just work on audio and there's a very good reason for that. But over the past year, well actually over the past 10 years, I'm going to share with you my experience. You're currently hearing me on the Tascam DR10L. I'm going to get into more details about this one. This is an omnidirectional lavalier mic. It records directly into a base unit, not into the camera. Everything records into here. This is not wireless. But I really love this because this gives me about 20 different settings that I can tune so that way in post I don't, do, I don't have to do anything other than maybe change the amplitude a little bit. But when I'm doing a lot of run and gun stuff I like to use microphones such as the Sennheiser MKE 400. I also have the Rode VideoMic Pro, and I did this video here looking at both of them. Now, when there's no noise whatsoever, the VideoMic Pro provides a more full sound, but when there's any sort of wind, the VideoMic Pro just it becomes terrible. The Sennheiser has a wind filter, and even without that wind filter on, it's pretty good. Now, I have to be honest with you, that wind filter does make the voice sound a little bit more tinny, so I usually leave it off. And even when there is wind blowing, it sounds like wind. It doesn't sound annoying like the Video Mic Pro. So, sorry about that. I'm getting messages. I really, I really do like the Sennheiser for my run and gun stuff. So for studio stuff like this, I'm just using the lavalier. 
and I do synchronize with my um, video afterwards because the camera's recording audio it's very easy to sync very very simple uh, drop me a comment down below if you'd like more details on that but when I'm shooting outside doing run and gun work I quite often will mic up my subject and then I'll record audio with a separate source now this summer I did a lot of Q&A videos outside and what I tended to do is I would have the lavalier, the Tascam DR10L on myself, and I'd just be using the microphone built into the camera on the R5. I know what you're thinking, that's sacrilege. You can't do that, it's terrible. Well, here's what I did. In post, I synchronized the audio, but I didn't mute the in-camera audio. What I did is I dropped it by 8 dB. So in terms of my audio, um, everything coming from the Tascam completely overshadows my audio that's recorded in the camera and other annoying noises are usually so low that it's just overheard over the ambient sound that's a great thing about recording outside there's so much ambient sound that by lowering it by 8 db things such as birds or squirrels or other wildlife are picked up and even if you do pick up your neighbors what you can do is you can go into the audio clip and you can just remove that part because that's where if the air conditioners or other trucks are going by it's not the best but I found that in most cases, by lowering it by my, minus 8 dB, I was getting a really good audio source. But when I'm doing run and gun stuff, I'll put on the Sennheiser and I'm off to the races. And one of the reasons I don't put a mic on my camera when I'm shooting my outdoor interviews, they're about an hour long, sometimes an hour and a half. And if the battery runs dead in the shotgun, guess what? I have no audio and I have no baseline. So I really like having... Um, using the in-camera mic for that situation but it, it's it's about playing around and since you are getting started with this I think if you start off with a Tascam DR10L it would be a great addition and here's why let me show you what you can set using this so the first option I just ignore and I'm going to get into that very shortly it does have a low cut filter and this helps reducing wind noise and other unwanted audio limiter prevents peaking and this is really good so if I'm speaking quietly or loud then what this does is pretty well level things out which saves you a ton of time in post now the auto level this will dynamically change gain based on the speaking level so this is why we ignore the mic gain sample rate pretty much 48 for most cameras uh, it does give you an option in case your camera isn't 48 and bit rate keep it at 24 let's keep it with a higher quality audio it's audio after all it doesn't take up a lot of space but what i really love about this one here is it records two separate audio streams one at in this case minus 6 db and one at minus 12 db and so if you get any peaking with the minus 6 you queue up the minus 12 and it's it's a lifesaver so it's a really really terrific option mp3 mode turn it off you really don't need that tracking i don't use this if you turn it on it splits up the file into 15 minute increments uh, warning beeps i don't use that either because i'm a one-man show so unless i have headphones on i can't hear any beeping and the last power save, I set this to 10 minutes, or it sets to 10 minutes when you turn it on. So if you forget to turn it off, it automatically turns itself off. So there are more features, but what the end result of this is in post, the only thing I generally have to tweak is maybe up the volume a little bit by maybe 3 dB, and that is it. So that's why I love this. And I'm not dealing with a poor preamp for the camera. And it's around $200. You can find the link in the description down below. Another question from Nick. With a lot of software available for video editing, what do you recommend for someone just getting into video? Budget, option, and ease of use. So to answer this question, Moving Matt has volunteered to help us out. I would like to thank Moving Matt to help us out here with this video. And guys, after this video is over, give Moving Matt a look and subscribe to his channel. Mr. Matt? Hey everyone, welcome to Moving Matt. I make videos similar to Simon's, but a little bit more on the satirical side with the occasional vlog and some travel videos thrown in the mix. I have to do something to differentiate myself. That guy can outpost me five to one. Don't let those kind Canadian eyes fool you. The man's a beast. Okay, Nick, let's get to your question. So you're getting started in video editing and you wanna know what is the best video editing software based on budget and ease of use? Well, as I hear Simon often say, I really need more information. For example, are you using a Mac or a PC? but I will try to answer the question in a broad enough way that you can pick which scenario best applies for you. Okay, when it comes to professional video editing software, I personally think you have three high quality choices. Final Cut Pro, Adobe Premiere Pro, and DaVinci Resolve. If you are on PC, 
we can take Final Cut Pro out of the mix for now and focus on Premiere and DaVinci. Premiere Pro is a great system and I actually started my editing days out on it. Although times are a changing, Premiere Pro is still considered an industry standard. It is a great editing software for working in teams and as such, some video editing jobs will actually require you to work in it. So if you have ambitions of working as a video editor for a big company someday, Premiere may be the way to go. It is a very robust editing software and there are a lot of tutorials out there to teach you how to do the many things you can do. That may be one do too many. The cons of Premiere are it is definitely not budget friendly. It can't be bought outright and just for Premiere Pro it is $21 a month and that locks you in for a year. And I think most people would agree in order to get the most out of Premiere Pro it's probably best to buy the entire suite of Adobe apps. That will give you Adobe Rush that will allow you to edit on the go as well as Lightroom and Photoshop for photo editing. I saw in your follow-up comment that you are looking to get into photo editing as well so you would definitely want those. If you are getting everything you'll be looking at $50 $52.99 a month locked in for a year or $72.49 paid month to month. The other cons of Premiere Pro is it can be buggy and slow. And after I switched to Final Cut Pro, in retrospect, the interface kind of looks outdated. And on top of all that, there is a steep learning curve. So Nick, you may be thinking to yourself, you spent the entire start of this answer telling me about an editing program that doesn't meet my budget or ease of use criteria. And to that, I say, yes. Yes, I did. But I want you to be aware of what Adobe has to offer because sometimes you can save money now but lose it in the long run if you decide to switch. And when it comes to ease of use, if you are starting from scratch, all professional programs will have a learning curve to some degree or another. It's like learning a language as a baby. You don't know if Chinese, German, or English is the easiest. You just know what you're introduced to first. So don't worry about ease of use on any of these too much. Pick which one feels right for you. I'm confident that you can figure out any of them. Sometimes you gotta take a risk. Nick Risk. I just had to use that in here somewhere. That is one of the coolest names I've ever heard. Okay, I'm gonna speed up here. These next two shouldn't take me as long. DaVinci Resolve is an editing software that has came a long way. Originally, it was a tool that most people just use for color grading, and now it is one of the leading NLEs out there. And with its color grading history, it has some of the best color grading tools built in. And you know that budget you were talking about? Well, it's free. At least there is a very robust free version that will be enough for a lot of people, especially a beginner. But later you can pay $300 for a lifetime license and get more features. It is quick, sleek, can be used on Mac and PC, and the more I'm talking about it, the more it makes me want to switch. I am happy with where I am on Final Cut Pro, but looking back on it, there is a piece of me that wishes I would have started out with DaVinci, and from talking to Simon about it, I feel he may share a similar sentiment. Okay, so what's the downsides of DaVinci Resolve? So maybe I don't know enough about it to know all the downsides, but for one, it isn't quite as easy to find tutorials about using it. As with Premiere Pro and Final Cut, you can pretty much type anything you would want to do in YouTube and find a great video explaining how to do it. And well, the other downside leads me to Final Cut Pro. So if if you're a Mac guy like I am, we have Final Cut Pro X or 10 as some may call it. If you don't have a Mac and don't plan on owning one, then you can skip ahead to Simon's next question and go with the information in hand. If you do have a Mac, then Final Cut Pro is definitely worth considering. It is extremely fast and like pretty much everything else Apple, it is very well optimized. I personally love the look and feel of it. The magnetic timeline makes everything quick and snappy. Pun intended. Some people aren't fans of the magnetic timeline, but I am, and that is one of the downsides for DaVinci or pretty much any other video editing software for that matter. Like DaVinci, it is $300 for a lifetime license. None of that pay for it forever deal. There isn't a free version exactly, but iMovie kind of is the free version. So if you need to edit while you save up for it, you can use that in the meantime. Another thing I really like about Final Cut is all the great plugins you can buy to give your videos a little extra flair. But that brings me to the cons of Final Cut Pro, and that is it's a little bare bones in some ways. And quality plugins can cost money. The other big con is file sizes. You will likely want to work off an external storage in some capacity. And finally, the biggest con is it is Mac only. Granted, it probably wouldn't be as fast and well optimized if it wasn't. Well, Nick, I hope that gives you the information that you need to decide what works best for you. Before I go, let me give a little reminder. If you haven't already, be sure to give a like and subscribe to Simon. Not only does he put out a lot of great quality content, but he is also the type of guy to reach down to a small YouTuber like myself and give me a bigger platform to help build me up. And for that, I am very grateful. So back to you, Simon. 
Thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you for taking the time to answer this question for my viewers. And now, for our next question. Christoph asks, have you ever had a problem with hot pixels with your Canon EOS R5, which are already visible in the EVF and display before taking the photo? It's not about sensor noise, but about individual very prominent hot pixels. I've never seen this before with Canon, Sony, or Fuji in such a way that pixels can be seen in the EVF before the picture is taken. Well, actually, Christoph, this is normal when you're having dead pixels or hot pixels. Because you're talking about a mirrorless camera, instead of getting the the view coming directly from outside, because with a normal uh, viewfinder, you're not seeing what the sensor sees, but with a mirrorless camera, you're getting the video feed or you're getting the feed directly off the sensor. So if there's a dead pixel, you're going to see it on the EVF as much as the LCD, and you're going to see it even before you take the picture or video. It's really annoying. So in this video, I'm going to address two things. How to fix it so it corrects it, and also how to fix your video afterwards should you have to try and move a dead pixel. So first off, this is based on the Canon R5, but it's pretty much the same process for all Canon cameras. It just might be in a different menu position. So first, we want to go to the wrench menu, and we want to select sensor cleaning. Then go ahead and select OK, and don't do anything. Let it sit for about a minute. Don't rush this. Then after a minute, turn the camera off, and that dead pixel should be gone. Shoot some video, and usually what I like to do to test this out, and this is a great way to test out to see where your dead pixels are. Normally, they're very prominent. Put the lens cap on, take a picture, and it's going to be pretty evident. Okay, so you've shot a video, and you want to keep it and you want to remove that dead pixel in post. There are some easy ways to do this. If your frame isn't moving around a lot, like if your camera's steady, it's pretty easy to do. For Final Cut Pro, I downloaded something called BG Pixel Blaster, and what that allows me to do is just zoom in on where the, the, the pixel is, I press the button, and what it does is it grabs color information, um, pixel information from around the dead pixel to fill in the spot. And you can change the diameter based on how big the dead pixel is. And it works quite well. I managed to save a video of mine from years ago. It was with my son, and uh, it, it took a little fiddling around. It's the, the, the directions aren't the easiest. But the other thing you can do, too, is you can actually create a B-roll. So copy your A-roll, put it on top, really trim it down. Uh, you're going to have to zoom in very far to do this, and then just shift it over a bit, and it's going to cover that up. But uh, BG Pixel Blaster for Final Cut Pro, I use, and it does a wonderful job. Ming asks, Hey, I've got a question about the Canon 90D and the R6. I just recently started my channel. I do a bit of traveling and now learning B-roll. However, I think I'm going to do wildlife photography and documentary. Which camera do you think would do better? Now, Ming, thank you for providing me a bit more context. First, let's take a look at these two cameras side by side. The Canon 90D is an APS-C camera, whereas the Canon R6 is a full-frame camera. So in low light, you're going to be able to take better shots, and you're going to be able to take full advantage of a lens. So if you've got a lens such as the 50mm f1.8, it really is a 50mm f1.8. Whereas on the 90E, that 50mm f1.8 becomes more like an 80mm, and the 1.8 becomes, well, 0.6 times that. It's about 2.5 or something. So that's something to consider. Not only is there certain mathematics involved here, but you get a different look with the different sensors as well. Now, you can get a 90D to look similar to a full frame. I'll get into that in another question. This, this is really a huge amount of information here, but just for now, to keep it simple, more you're able to receive more light. So if you're shooting in dusk and dawn, such as you're doing wildlife stuff, you're going to be able to get better pictures. In terms of processors, the 90D uses the old Digic 8, whereas the R6 uses the Digic 10. And this is huge. First of all, it's a lot faster, so it can do things a lot better. It can it feeds into the auto the autofocus, it feeds into tracking, it feeds into how detailed your video feeds are going to be as well. So the 90D is a little bit more soft, but it's working with the Digic 8. Now it can do 4K, which is great. The R6 does 4K too, but the R6 does 5.1 oversampled 4K, so 5.1, it captures 5.1 down samples in camera, giving you a more detailed, a much more detailed image than the 90D. And it's, you know, it's so detailed that you can put them side by side, showed your mother or your father, whoever just doesn't know anything about cameras, and they can go, oh yeah, this one's so much better. So that is, that that's a big difference, especially for landscape. Now in terms of ISO, 
you've also got a much greater range with the R6, which isn't really surprising that it's a full frame sensor. Another big thing, you're doing wildlife, has IBIS. So that faster processor with IBIS, with dynamic, better dynamic range, is just going to produce better results, better results time and time again. Also, the R6 has a weather sealed body. This is really important. I think the, R, the 90D does have some weather sealing, weather resistance, but it's not at the same level as the R6. And this is very important if you're shooting out a lot, outdoors a lot, you're shooting wildlife, you get a little bit of rain, a little bit of snow. As soon as that snow hits your camera, it's going to melt. So you want to be using a weather sealed camera and also consider weather sealed lenses as well. No sense getting a camera that's sealed and then the lens lets in the moisture. Also, when it comes to video, the R6 has Canon Log 1. Uh, this is really great for high contrast scenes. If you're shooting and it's really dark out, it also helps. Uh, but if you're shooting in bright sunny days and everything's pretty bright, then it's not going to benefit. You don't use C-Log all the time. You generally want to use it where there's not a lot of light or when there's a high contrast difference. So that is really big too. The 90D doesn't have that. Now in terms of 120 frames per second, both cameras have it. But, and here is a big but here, Autofocus on the R6 works at 120 frames per second. Now both are in 1080, neither do 120 frames per second in 480, but I've never really known that to be a huge, big bummer. Dual card slots don't matter to all of us. I've never had a problem with a failed card, but now that I have dual cards, I love it. Now my video, here's the thing with video, it doesn't matter what camera you get, even the, the 5D, 5D, the R5, doesn't record video to both card slots. It does if you're shooting 8K RAW, and it does if you set up a proxy file, but that's the only scenario. But photos, you're doing a lot of photos, that really comes in. So if you can afford the budget, the R6 is that much better than the 90D. Yes, the 90D doesn't overheat, the R6 does, but you get about 50 minutes with current firmwares in 4K. So there's, I just think that based on what you're telling me, you'll be a lot happier with the R6. But again, you know, put out your capabilities, put it on a piece of paper, on a, an Excel, and identify what are the outcomes you want. Some of the things I've discussed here might be very important, some might not. Prince asks, Simon, please tell me the different ways of using Canon R5 422 10-bit for editing. Does Canon's footage edit well on Apple's new M1 PC? So these are the four different ways that I will record uh, my 10-bit video. And the only way to get 10-bit video on these cards is, of course, using C-Log. So the first is record to CF Express cards, and then I can edit off these cards or I can just copy it in. I'm gonna, even with my iMac Pro, when I'm using C-Log, I'm getting dropped frames. Now, because it's an iMac Pro, I can just push through it. It's not too bad, especially these videos here. ProRes. If I convert my footage to ProRes, I use Apple's uh, software, what is it called? Not motion, um, compressor. If I use compressor and convert everything to ProRes, which takes time depending on how long the, the videos are. If these are 10 minute videos, five minute videos, no big deal. But if I'm dealing with an hour, you're looking at a good hour to just convert to ProRes and that's expensive. But when you're editing, no drop frames whatsoever. And that's ideal, which brings me up to the next option. If you're using an external recorder like the Atmos Ninja 5, it's recording to the SSD in ProRes. You can edit off so you don't have any transfer speeds and you don't have to convert. You're ready to go right away. And I did this video not too long ago talking about the Atmos Ninja 5 and the biggest selling point, the biggest selling point is just the amount of time you save. And in that case, yeah, again, you're dealing with ProRes, so there's absolutely no slowness whatsoever. And the last option, you do need a computer that's capable of editing 4K, even if it's efficient. 4K is, a, it's got a lot more information. It's got four times the amount of information as Full HD, so you're going to need a powerful enough computer with a power enough GPU, and you're going to need a ton of storage. I just had to shell out about $461 for a Samsung Evo 4 terabyte SSD just for one project that I'm working on. So that's another issue there. So those are the four ways. Um, let me know if you have any other questions on this and uh, post it in the comment section down below and I'll follow up with you. Clive asks, what's the best mirrorless video camera for under $2,000 or should I wait to 2021? Well, again, it's another one of those questions, Clive, where you're asking me, should I wait? And if you're asking, then obviously time is not of the essence. So wait, 2020 was an amazing year for Sony, for Canon, for many companies, Fuji as well. 
2021 is just going to be as amazing. And I think as spring rolls along, as we get this COVID out of the way and things, we start to getting back to our normal lives. Uh, the Olympics are going to be coming out this year. Uh, I think it's going to be a very exciting year, just how we feel emotionally. But in terms of cameras coming out, Canon's going to be coming out with about three cameras. There's the R1, there's the R7, there's the R8 and the R9. So there's a lot coming out. So if you can wait, wait. Uh, Sony, Nikon are coming out with other cameras too. But let's take a look at your question. So under $2,000, and there's a lot of really good cameras. Um, let's take a look at Fuji. There's the X-T4. I think this is a major improvement over the X-T3. So if you've got a Fuji X-T3, if you've got Fuji gear, Fuji lenses, then, you know, seriously take a look at the X-T4. And if you're looking at Sony, then, well, there's a couple of options for Sony. You first of all got the a7 III. I almost said the a7S III. The a7 III is just under $2,000 and is a really good camera. And if we look at APS-C, we got, I think, was it the Sony 6100? I made a note here. Sony, no, sorry, the Sony a6600 for DSLRs. For Canon, uh, we've got a lot of options. We've got the Canon EOS RP and the Canon EOS R. Now, I think the RP is better at photos as well as the R, but the R gives you more video features. But I really think those two cameras coming out that are more or less going to replace the R and the RP in the first six months, I think that is going to be a lot more interesting to you if you're a Canon uh, owner. So, it, And it sounds like you have the ability to switch between brands, but I think it's very important for people who have a lens inventory that you're probably stuck within that silo because the cost of switching is not something many of us can afford. So on the Canon side, on, on the APS-C, well, we've got a few options. We've got the Canon 90D, and actually not the, at the M system too, you've got the M6 Mark II, uh, but back to the DSLR, you've got the Rebel T8i, which is also, also another great camera, and these are actually under $1,000, especially on sale around Christmas time. And what else, what else, what else, what else? Um, and the Nikon, the Nikon Z6. I think it's a great camera. It's... In its category, it's midpoint between low price and high price, and it's mid-capable too, but that doesn't mean it's bad. This whole thing about getting the best camera, it's a silly thing. Well, who's best camera from my point of view, from what I need? You're not looking at getting the best camera. You're looking at getting the camera that best meets your capabilities. And I think that the Nikon Z6 is a great camera. If you have Nikon gear, Nikon lenses, and you're looking at getting a mirrorless camera and you want good photo and video, then the Z6 is a terrific camera. So I wasn't going to come out with just one camera. Oh, and another thing too, um, when you're out and about, a smartphone. The, the iPhone 12 is a terrific camera and um, Google uh, Android or Samsung Galaxy are terrific cameras too because sometimes they're the camera we have. We don't always have our mirrorless or DSLR with us. Lyndon asks, What's your thinking? With Sony coming out with the a7 IV, what will Canon do with their pricing of the R5 and the R6? I strongly believe we're going to get the Sony a7 IV within the first six months of 2021. And what is Canon going to do? Well, nothing. Um, Canon isn't going to lower the price of the R5 or the R6 just because Sony releases a camera, or anybody for that matter. However, as we get around May, this is traditionally a time, at least here in Canada, when we see Canon offering discounts on their bodies and lenses. And this is usually coming up to around Mother's Day and Father's Day, and that's what I've noticed. And I've seen some steep discounts of around three to $400 on some lenses. So if discounts come, it's gonna be because Canon's planning on doing it, not because of something another company does. Um, and because these cameras are selling so well, especially the, the R5, there's really very little pressure on Canon to do anything other than keep, to keep the price where it is. I think the earliest that we might see a discount on the R5 or even the R6 might be Black Friday next year or December, just up to Christmas time. Another question from Clive. What are your thoughts about the Canon EOS R Mark II? When will it be launched and what are the specs? Well, this topic has been very popular on my channel. In fact, the video where I covered this leaked specifications from back in January is my number one, garnering about 42,000 views. But I've got some bad news for you. Uh, according to what I've heard from Craig at Canon Rumors, and he's pretty sure about this, the R5, sorry, the EOS R and the RP are one-off cameras. Canon rushed them out the door to let the market know that they're serious about mirrorless because Canon was very late. Their first mirrorless camera came out in 2018, which is many, many generations past what other companies have been doing. Now, 
we're starting to see a normal nomenclature in how these cameras are named, the R5, the R6, the R7, the R8, the R9. Canon is not killing off the idea of the RP and the R. So in terms of the EOS R Mark II, here's my thoughts on this. We've really got two cameras that kind of fit this space. There's the R6, and if we look at the price between the R6 and the EOS R, we're looking at release prices. The R6 is just a little bit more expensive than the EOS R, but it's far more capable in photo and video. It's, it's like a mini 1DX Mark III. It's very powerful, but again, it's $2,500. In 2021, Canon's going to be announcing a camera that sits between the current EOS R and the R6 based on current day pricing, so it's going to be mid-priced, and it's going to be mid-spec between the EOS R and the R6. So that camera might be, in, if you don't like the R6, then that camera is probably going to be of interest to you. Um, and is there anything else I want to cover on this? So the specs. Now, as far as specs goes, we don't have any leaked specs on these new cameras coming out in 2020. And of course, the R6, we know quite a bit. It does 4K 30. Remember, this is not cropped. Every camera up to this point had cropped 4K. It's not cropped. It's 5.1K down sampled. Yes, it overheats after about 50 minutes based on 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The overall capabilities, they're far greater than what we have with the EOS R. I've been going through the custom button settings on the R5 and I can't seem to find a way to map out one of the buttons to do a 1.6 crop. Is there any way to do this or do I need to set one of my custom shooting modes to 1.6 crop? Okay, a really terrific question. And what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to hand it over to the village mayor to answer this question using his R6. Now the menus between the R5 and the R6 in this particular situation are pretty much the same. So. Over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Simon. In last weekend's viewer question video, I answered a question about how to bring up the cropped mode on the R6. The first method is through the menu under the red or shoot mode, and the second method is through the quick control system. The third method, which is what Christopher is asking, is through the custom buttons setting. Now, we only have the R6 and not the R5, but they likely have very similar settings. So in the menu, Go to the custom function or the orange mode under tab three and under the customize buttons. Now, once you're in the section, you will see the graphics of your camera. Choose the set button and you will see a bunch of graphics representing each function. There are dozens of them. You have to look for this button here, which represents the aspect ratio. As you can see, I've already selected that. Now go back to the camera and after pressing the button, voila, it's done. So there you have it. Thanks to Christopher for the question and John Drummond for helping out as well. So back to over to you, Simon. Thanks a lot, Mr. Mayor. And guys, check out his channel after this video. And now for our next question. John says, I'm very happy with my camera mount Rode Wireless Go 2.4 gigahertz lav mic system costing around $280. What's the difference between this and the $700 1.9 gigahertz Sennheiser AVX ME2 wireless lav set? Is that difference worth over $300, especially given Rode's stronger transmitter. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and answer your question. Actually, you kind of already answered your own question. If you're happy with what you've got, keep that money in your wallet. Buy something else you need. John, we, there's so many demands for the money in what we do in a kit and gear that if you are happy with what you're getting with your Rode VideoMic Pro, don't change it. Stay with it. Now, to answer your question, the Sennheiser AVX system works with better quality lab mics used with Sennheiser's Evolution systems, and it's able to avoid interference with other sources in the same band. But again, you know, if you're happy with what you got, don't change it. Look, I'm using a lavalier, the Tascam DR10L for my studio stuff and outside. I use other mics. I use the uh, Sennheiser MKE 400, and I really like that. I don't use wireless. I don't really like it. Maybe I'm a bit of an old fogey, but I like recording into the Tascam where I'm not having to deal with the camera's preamp and fiddling around with all that stuff. I like that everything is set on the task cam. So time and time again, I'm ready to shoot and then I just bring it in and post and it's good to go. So once again, John, thank you for your question. De Westel asks, is there a simple rule of light that helps me determine how much more light a C needs when I raise the record FPS, something like 30p at X amount of lux, 60p two times lux and 120p four times lux. Okay, first of all, guys, what he means by lux, we're talking about luminance. So this is all about understanding the lighting of your scene. Um, and unlike the 180 degree shutter rule, there really isn't a rule of thumb. In a way, there's a whole bunch of different rules 
that you have to follow. So let's look at this scenario. I'm outside, I'm shooting my scene, and I've got a subject. It's bright, it's sunny. So what I do is I hold up a light meter or a luminance meter right where my subject is, and based on my shutter of 1 60th and my ISO of 800, it tells me that I need to shoot at f22. And that might be fine. But a lot of times what happens is we're thinking, you know what, the Westall, I, I want to have that cinematic look, or I want to have a blurred background. I want to separate the subject from the background. And the magic usually happens somewhere between f2.2 and f2.8, depending on how close your camera is to your subject. And of course, your subject is from the background. So in this situation, what will happen is we'll expose based on f or we'll meter based on f22, based on a shutter of 1 800th, and set your ISO as well. And your, your luminance meter is going to go nuts and say, Simon, you've got to be on some sort of serious drugs here. You're overexposed by five stops. No problem. Get out your variable ND filter or your ND filter. It doesn't have to be variable. That's capable of five stops. And there you go. Problem solved. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. And that's why I'm saying it, it's almost like if you guys have ever done project management, you've got your scope. This is everything you want to do. You've got the schedule and you've got the cost. Now, if the schedule says you got to do it in three months and your boss says you got to do it in two months, yeah, no problem, boss. But then you're going to either have to give me more money or we're going to have to reduce the scope. And it's the same thing with a camera. You've got, you've got your exposure. You've got your shutter. You've got your f-stop. You've got your ISO. And if you change any one of these, it's going to affect the other. So that's why it's, you've kind of got rules, but it's, it's understanding everything about your exposure, your metering, um, all that sort of stuff. I wish there was a simple rule. Rina Pranita asks, does the R5S have a cooling system? Well, we know very little about the leak specs on the R5S, so I can't say, but I'm hazarding a bet it's going to be similar to the Canon EOS R5. I wouldn't be surprised, surprised if they tweak it. The R5 current architecture could record hours of 8K video without overheating. It's just got a really bad architecture right now. They could put in a copper plate. There's other things they could do with heat pipes. They could better use better paste. Um, but at this point, it's all speculation. Well, it's not even speculation. It's all conjecture at this point because we don't really have anything to base it off of. Leo asks, Simon, I don't understand if the iPhone 12 is only 12 megapixels and it's the best camera of 2020 for you, then the A7S III also only 12 megapixels should be the very best camera for you or not. This is a really good question. This is based on the video that I put out earlier this week where I talked about the best camera. And I came out and said that the iPhone 12, for most ordinary filmmakers, is the best. I didn't say it was the best for me. I'm shooting with the Canon R5. I'm not shooting with my iPhone. I, and, and let me give you an example. So this was probably a couple of weeks ago. My wife was making these incredible cakes and she was taking a picture with her iPhone and they look really good. And I said, look, I can do a better picture. So I turned on the lights down here. I used the studio here. I set the table up. After about five minutes, I was ready to shoot. She says, oh my God, you're taking so long. I shot the picture. I didn't have it metered properly. I made a few settings. And finally, I had some really good pictures and they were better than hers. But 10 minutes later, and I know if I was a professional product photographer and it's not my bag, it's not something I do. But for ordinary folks, and that's what I'm getting to, to set things up with a DSLR camera or mirrorless camera takes a lot more effort. Whereas the iPhone, it takes 14 different shots, it, or it takes the shot and it does 14 different computations on it to give you better dynamic range, better exposure. And I'm just looking at the results she's getting and I'm going like, oh my God, she's for what she needs for social media, 12 megapixels is more than enough and it's the best camera for her. For me, it's a completely different story. And so these cameras, as the companies will tell you, are built for different people. The Sony A7S III is a stills hybrid camera. It's a video-centric stills hybrid camera, but it's still a stills hybrid camera. Look at it. The architecture is not a camcorder. It's not a cinema camera. It's a stills camera that produces really good video. So that is why I kind of came up with that. Um, again, there are different marketplaces. And I just, you look at the sales, you look at how easy it is to use these iPhone 12s, and that's the reason why it came up as the best camera. The Sony a7S III is up against a different, whole different category of cameras, and so different explanation there. D does that help? Let me know if I've 
clear things up or I've just tossed a little bit more mud on it. Another great question from Stop the FOMO. What is the reason Canon cinema cameras continue to utilize Super 35 sensors when Sony has already moved on to full frame? Is this to meet market demand or is Canon just slow to implement change? This is going to be a very different answer than how I've kind of looked at this question in the past because I see where you're going with this and I remember the previous questions. I'm going to say this is a bit more of an emotional journey. This is, this is more about storytelling. This is about what is the look you're trying to get. Your equipment, your lenses, your settings, your lighting, everything creates a slightly different look. And that's really important. So here, here's a quote from No Film School. Ask yourself why. Why you choose a certain camera, lens, or resolution? Why do you want a shallow depth of field? Why do you need a steady cam at this moment? And why do you need this framing? Why is a very important question. Ask yourself the question why until you get to the real answer, the answer that goes, that you go, yeah, that makes sense. Now, I also want to show you this page that no film school has come up with. I, I could have answered this myself, but when I saw this, I thought they've done a really good job of answering this. And what they've done here is they first of all talk about telling you about the story that you need to create. Then they go into talking about client constraints, because sometimes client constraints or even your own budgetary constraints can tell you what kind of equipment you're using. Then they compare full frame versus super 35 in terms of shallow depth of field, different focal lengths, and of course the distance from your subject. As I was saying earlier, when I shoot myself outside, I'm about so many feet from the camera, and then the camera's so many feet from the background. Now, if I push the camera a little closer to myself, it's gonna blow out the background quicker, and I might have to change that f-stop just to fully separate myself from the backdrop. And you look at certain movies like The Revenant, they use full frame, and what they do is they push in a bit more to blow out the background more, creating a more versus environment. And so that's why I think you need to ask yourself why. You've got a great channel. I really think you produce some really great stuff. And I think part of your soul searching there is you've got to ask yourself, is this for your channel? Is this for something else? Why do you care? Why do you care if it's Super 35 or full frame? How do these different cameras, these different architectures, give you different results? Take a look at this article by No Film School. I think it'll really help open your eyes. I was kind of surprised at some of the things myself, too, by just how it could change the background. Um, so you know that the Super 35 has a 1.5 times crop, right? So what we can do is we can change the distance to the subject so we're framing it the same. And you would think everything would look the same, right? No, it doesn't. So take a look at that article. Um, it, it's not too long, and it, it's... It'll give you a bit of an epiphany. It's, it's, it's really terrific. Just Chris asks, EOS R1, R7, and maybe an update for the RP in addition to the R5, R6, and R, and the EOS M series cameras that Canon seems hesitant to discontinue. Isn't Canon overcrowding their mirrorless lineup, making it increasingly complicated for anyone just looking for a good camera? No. Yes. So for somebody who's not familiar with Canon's lineup, you look at everything out there and you're thinking like, my God, this is too confusing. But actually when you look a little closer, things aren't as complicated. So let me help break down their lineup right now. At the top, we have the 1DX Mark III and the R1 is gonna be a mirrorless upgrade to that. And at this level, it's all about fast action. You're taking sports or anything where it's fast action. It's a photocentric camera that does good video, but it's photocentric. And then the Canon EOS R5, which is, a the 5 Series camera is like a 5D Mark IV, but it's it's an upgrade to that. It produ it's, it's, it's a stunning camera for stills. It's, it produces great video, but it's a stills camera first with great video. It's not as fast as the 1DX Mark III or the R1 will be, but if you don't need that fast action and you're good at 8 to 12 frames per second mechanical, this camera is good enough for you. Next, we have the R6. So the R6, I'd say, is kind of like a mini 1DX Mark III. It's got the same processor. It's fast. It's got a great autofocus system. The, the question now you're asking yourself, well, do you want something like a high megapixel camera, such as 45 megapixels on the R5 as a photographer, or does 20 megapixels work? Because outside of there, your frame rates, your frame speeds, everything is pretty much identical for cheaper. Now on the video side, there are definite differences. You lose the 8K video, you 
you no longer have 4k 30 that doesn't overheat but you do have 4k 30 at 5.1 oversampled in camera so you've got that so the r6 is for somebody who wants to save a bit of money that doesn't need everything that the r5 gives which is a full professional photographer for sorry it's a full professional camera that's aimed at people who spend their life doing photography but also want good video it's a it's a great compromise camera next we look at the r and the rp and these again were canon's first attempts at mirrorless i'd almost forget about these and i would look to the r8 the r9 and the r7 the r7 is going to be a full frame version of or a, a very similar to the 60 and the 70 the 60 is a full frame camera and the 70 is an APS-C version and I think that's where we get the R7 the R8 and R9 and I'm not going to talk about these too much right now because we don't have leaked specifications so it's all conjecture then we talk about the EOS M line and yes to a lot of us in North America and Europe this doesn't make a lot of sense but in Japan it's a top selling camera it fits well there is no migration path currently from the EOS M to the RF and most likely there won't be and of course your EF and EFS those will migrate so DSLR is essentially what Canon is doing in 2020 and 21 they're taking all the DSLRs that they like the product points and they're converting them over to mirrorless so by the time we end 2021 you'll have a very good visual of everything that Canon has in their lineup and then based on capability photo and video you're going to have the camera that's right for you the village mayor says to some one of the crux of the r6 is 20 megapixels even for me i wish it had more than 20 megapixels for my architecture and landscape shots has canon ever thought about pixel shift for the r6 to allow users like myself the option of higher megapixels or would that compete with the r5 lumix s1 also has pixel shift so no one out competes the other no i, I really can't see them doing that pixel shift is going to be in a high megapixel camera and I think where we're going to see that is in the R5S I, I just it it doesn't I'm not a big fan of pixel shift uh, you really need a very solid tripod you need a background where there's not a lot of movement and you definitely need a very very fast processor so it can take those shots very quickly so that even a slight movement in the blades of grass or the, the leaves in a tree or even the slight vibrations you get from the ground aren't going to cause any weird artifacts and our last question is from Paul Edwards is the village mayor actually a mayor or is that just his handle online the village mayor is not a mayor at least he isn't yet I don't know if he has any ambitions of power I'll leave the village mayor to answer this one but uh, I do like his title I you know oddly enough I've shot with him a lot we talk a lot I've never asked him why he came up with the village mayor but I do like it it's got a very down to earth and approachable name don't you think all right well that concludes another week of questions i got an awful lot this week and next week is going to be a very busy week it's christmas boxing day is on thursday and christmas is on friday so my question to you is when should i hold the q a next week i'm still planning on shooting it should i release it christmas day what about boxing day or should i do it on saturday or sunday you know what scratch scratch christmas eve i think well, either way I'm going to put out a poll uh, if you're watching this video now the polls out there let me know when you would like to see the Q&A video it might be a little smaller than previous ones but yeah should it be Sunday Saturday or Friday Christmas Day let me know in the comments section down below but thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win the single laugh S6E and M3 shotgun microphones I'll be, I'll, I'll be awarding these two prizes to one lucky viewer once the channel reaches 20,000 subscribers and then for my 30,000 step I've already identified some prizes Angel Bird has sent me dual 128 gigabyte SD cards UHS 2 V90 cards I'll get into the details in a separate video these will be awarded to one lucky viewer once the channel reaches 30,000 viewers and I'll put out a video as soon as the channel reaches 20,000 so that's coming up and then I'll be offering up another prize every 10,000 or so subscribers after that until this channel reaches 100,000 subscribers at which point I'll be giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer and on that bombshell thanks for watching the ordinary filmmaker we'll see you again soon